The meeting uh, will come to order. Good morning and thank you for coming to this organizational meeting of the Subcommittee on Select Revenue Measures for the 112th Congress. I'll try to keep the meeting short so we can begin today's hearing and accommodate the schedule of our witnesses. This meeting is open to the public and therefore will be an official transcript of the proceedings. First, I want to take a moment to thank, to say thanks to all of you for being part of this committee. And I look forward to working with my good friend, Ranking Member Richie Neal. As chairman of the committee last session, he set a high bar for making this subcommittee, the Select Revenue Measures Subcommittee, a bipartisan committee. I enjoyed the opportunity to work with him on a number of important issues in the last Congress, including, but not limited to, the net operating loss carryback, for which Richie deserves a tremendous amount of credit for becoming law. There's no doubt the subcommittee will tackle some tough issues like that in this Congress, including major tax reform, my hope is, and I look forward to working with him on some of those difficult issues going forward. Mr. Neal, would you like to make any opening remarks before we proceed? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm certainly honored to serve as the ranking member of the subcommittee. Uh, Pat T. Berry and I share the goal that this subcommittee should and remain, uh, will remain bipartisan in, in the same spirit of the last session. We strive to have witnesses who represent diverse points of view and have representation of our members' input to the greatest extent. I was very pleased with the work that we did in the last session. We held hearings on infrastructure financing, tax-exempt bonds, taxes as part of the federal budget, and two hearings highlighting how wealthy Americans have successfully hidden money in overseas banks, which resulted in legislation that shut down an $8 billion loophole. We play an important role in vetting issues for the full committee, and I look forward to continuing that role beginning with this hearing today. One issue I hope that we can take up soon is the way that we might help to increase savings for tens of millions of Americans who don't have access to workplace plans such as the auto IRA proposal. This hearing is about the new session of the Congress, but I did want to take a quick minute to acknowledge the staff that has assisted us during the last Congress, many of whom have moved on from the Hill or soon will be departing. I certainly want to thank Melissa Mueller, our staff director, Anthony Tate, our clerk, Pam Murray, Nathan Morgante, our staff assistants for the 111th Congress who all worked long hours to make us look good at the hearings. We certainly wish them well. And I want to thank the chairman for yielding. Thank you, Mr. Neal. And I'd like to introduce the members of the majority to my right uh, who are part of the, the new subcommittee. Mr. Heller, Mr. Heller of Nevada, Mr. Paulson of Minnesota, Mr. Berg of North Dakota, and Dr. Bustani of Louisiana. And I'll yield to Ranking Member Neal of Massachusetts to introduce his members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me introduce the Democratic subcommittee members, some of whom will be new to the subcommittee and some are returning members. Uh, first, my pal, Mr. Thompson of California, Mr. Larson of Connecticut, and we will welcome a new subcommittee member, uh, Mrs. Berkeley of Nevada, and I thank the chairman for yielding. Thank you, and I'd also I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce uh, our deputy whip, who's also a member of our committee, who's standing over there, Mr. Roskam of Illinois. And uh, I, too, would like to thank a former staff member, Adam Francis, who's no longer with me, who provided invaluable counsel on issues uh, dealing with tax policy for the last several years, and welcome Brad Bailey, uh, who is here with us today, and also introduce staff director for the subcommittee, George Callis, and legislative assistant, Zach Rudisil. Zach, you have to, okay. All right, first, uh, I want to take a moment to just, uh, hold on just a second here. I think we are about sure. ready to close up here. Uh, would you like to introduce minority staff? Or you I would certainly would. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Chairman. Go ahead. Uh, I do want to recognize the staff committee director, Aruna Kayalam, and John Young, who is here, and I thank you for yielding. Thank you. The chairman and ranking member or their designees will each make an opening statement before we hear from the witnesses. Um, other members may submit written statements for the record. The chair intends to require both witnesses and members to adhere to the five-minute rule for testimony and questioning. If needed, we may proceed with a second round of questioning. 
On occasion, other members of the committee or other members not on the committee may join us at hearings. I look forward to working with all of you in the months ahead. With that, the organizational meeting stands adjourned. Now that we've finished our organizational meeting, I'd like to call today's hearing to order. I want to welcome our witnesses to the hearing to discuss the taxation of small businesses and pass-through entities as part of a broader discussion on comprehensive tax reform. I believe there is a window of opportunity to enact comprehensive tax reform, and we must take advantage of it. Last November, the American people sent a strong message to Washington. They told Washington to stop putting off tough decisions, start making the decisions that will ensure future generations of Americans will prosper. Whether it be reducing the national debt, ensuring entitlements will remain solvent or reforming our tax code to encourage economic growth, saying it's too difficult isn't an excuse anymore. Our current system of taxation was written for an economy that was very different from the competitive global economy of today. It's time to enact a tax code that is competitive with the rest of the world, that is fairer, and that is simpler. Small, business mu small businesses must be included in comprehensive tax reform. Reforming corporate taxes means only reforming roughly 10 percent of federal revenues. That's not comprehensive. Many small businesses pay taxes as under the individual income tax rates, as pass-through entities, which we will hear more about today. The last thing we want to do as part of tax reform is create a situation where we're putting small businesses at a competitive disadvantage. I fear leaving them out of tax reform will do just that. Small businesses are the engine of economic growth in our economy. As we move forward with tax reform, the question we must ask ourselves is how we reform the code in a manner that empowers small businesses to grow and create jobs. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on those issues today. With that, I will yield to the ranking member, Mr. Neal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you for calling this hearing this morning. I hope that it will be the first of many on the topic of tax reform. Earlier, I commented on how this subcommittee always hears diverse points of views, and certainly this morning is no exception. We have one witness who is complaining that there are too many special provisions for small businesses that, and that the clutter is overwhelming. We have another saying that these special provisions make for a code that favors small businesses over large. And yet another tells us that we need to lower income taxes on the upper income to save small businesses. But one thing that we can agree on is that the U.S. offers some of the most flexible rules on structuring your business in the developed world, offering limited liability without the requirement of a corporate level tax. As one witness tells us today, we are second only to Mexico in the size of the unincorporated businesses as a total share of business, and that this self-help integration is a step towards reform. While this hearing is intended to explore special tax issues on pass-through entities, much of the discussion will involve small business incentives. We should note that the two are not necessarily the same. As one witness tells us, less than 1 percent of all pass-throughs are large businesses with more than $10 million in receipts, but they accounted for almost 60 percent of the total revenues of all pass-throughs. Confucius noted that a journey of 1,000 miles begins with a single step. I want to thank you, Mr. T. Berry, for taking that first step this morning on the road to tax reform. We hope the journey does not take 1,000 hearings. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Neal. I ask unanimous consent that all members' written statements will be included in the record without objection so ordered. We will now turn to our panel of witnesses whose bios are in your packages. Uh, I will uh, introduce them and then we will begin um, after I've introduced them all. Dr. Robert Carroll is from Ernst & Young. Um, Ms. Patricia Thompson is a tax partner at Piccarelli, Gilston & Company and chair of the AICPA Tax Executive Committee. Mr. Dennis Tarnay is the CFO of Lake Erie Electric and the former board member of the Ohio Society of C CPAs and from the great Buckeye State, and Dr. Donald Maroon is director of the Marin, excuse me, is director of the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Dr. Carroll, you may begin your testimony. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman T. Berry, Ranking Member Neal, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding the taxation of flow-through businesses and tax reform. I've had the opportunity to consider the taxation of flow-through businesses from a number of different perspectives inside and outside of government, 
in the context of broad reform of the code and narrow reform of the business tax system. More recently, I've been analyzing the flow-through sector in the course of preparing a report on behalf of the S Corporation Association. Today, I would like to share my perspectives and provide some preliminary results from the study on, flow through, on the flow-through sector we are preparing for release in the near future. Flow-through businesses, S Corporations, partnerships, limited liability companies, and sole proprietorships play an important role in the U.S. economy. The ma vast majority of businesses in the United States have chosen to organize as flow-through businesses. Today, flow-through businesses comprise more than 90% of all business entities, employ more than 50% of the workforce, and report more than one-third of all business receipts. Individual owners of flow-through flow businesses report 40% of all business net income. These individual owners also pay 43% of business taxes when filing their individual tax returns. The flow-through sector in the United States differs markedly from other developed nations. The business forms available in many other countries tend to push businesses towards the corporate form in pursuit of limited liability, whereas in the United States, such limited liability is attainable through various organizational forms outside of the corporate sector. This has resulted in a flow-through sector with considerable flexibility in how they organize and how they structure their operations. Businesses can choose between several different organizational forms, which may provide a better match to their management needs and capital requirements. The unincorporated business sector in the United States is also larger than in most other developed nations. Of the countries responding to a 2007 OECD survey, the unincorporated business sector was larger as a share of the total number of businesses in the U.S. in all but one country. With the increasing prominence of flow-through businesses, it is important to carefully consider how the flow-through form fits into the U.S. tax system and how any particular reform might affect flow-through businesses. Flow-through businesses are subject to a single level of tax on the income earned and allocated to their owners. Thus, it is the tax rates faced primarily by individual owners of flow-through businesses that affect decision-making and the economic health of these businesses. In contrast, the income of C corporations is subject to two levels of tax. First, when income is earned at the corporate level, and again, when the income is paid out to shareholders in the form of dividends or retained earnings, uh, uh, dividends or retained earnings, and later realized by shareholders as capital gains. Hence the phrase, the double tax on corporate profits. The double tax affects a number of important economic decisions. First, by increasing the cost of capital, it discourages investment and thus economic growth and job creation. Second, it leads to a bias in firms' financing decisions between the use of debt and equity. And third, it distorts the allocation of capital within the economy. The flow-through form provides an important benefit to the economy by reducing these economically harmful effects of the double tax. Recent focus on the need to lower the corporate income tax has also drawn attention to how flow-through businesses might be affected by tax reform. With substantial evidence that the U.S. corporate tax rate is out of step internationally, corporate tax reform is an important component of an overall approach to improving the current tax system. As with any such endeavor, however, it is important to keep in mind the potential for undesirable side effects. Corporate reform that eliminates business tax expenditures would have the unintended impact of raising the taxes of businesses organized using the flow-through form without offering the benefit of the lower corporate tax rate. Flow-through benefits, uh, flow-through businesses would lose the benefit of widely used and long-standing provisions, such as accelerated depreciation and the, and the uh, charitable giving deduction. In total, flow-through businesses use about 22% of the roughly $100 billion in annual business tax expenditures. Flow-through businesses are a large part of the U.S. business sector and important contributors to the economic vitality of the United States. As reform progresses, it is important to understand and consider all of these issues with an eye towards bringing about the tax reform that is most conducive to increased growth and job creation. The path towards tax reform will need to take into account many features of our tax system and strike a balance between a number of sometimes conflicting and competing objectives. This committee should be commended for holding this hearing to better understand the role that flow through, the flow-through sector plays in the U.S. economy. I thank you, and I would be pleased to address any questions the subcommittee might have. Five seconds to spare. Impressive. <laughs> Ms. Thompson. Good morning, Chairman T. Berry, Ranking Member Neal, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Patricia Thompson. I'm a CPA and chair of the AICPA Tax Executive Committee. My testimony today is based on my experiences with working with many small clients, business clients. 
I'm tax partner at Pitcherly Gilstein and Company, LLP, a CPA firm in Providence, Rhode Island, and have been with the firm for over 32 years. I'd like to thank this subcommittee for the opportunity to appear today. Chairman Tiberi, I would like to start by thanking you for your work in trying to repeal the two 1099 provisions. As noted in our written testimony, these are significant burdens on small businesses. Today's hearing focuses on the special burdens that the tax law imposes on small businesses. Business tax reform cannot merely change the corporate tax rates or other corporate provisions if the desired impact is to help small businesses, since many of them are not organized as corporations. I understand the challenges inherent in drafting tax legislation and appreciate your diligence in trying to do the right thing for taxpayers. My full written testimony discusses several burdens and complexities facing small businesses. In my brief time with you today, I'd like to highlight just a few. The first is tax simplification and depreciation is the best example. Methods to compute depreciation are different for tax and financial accounting purposes. Depreciation rates can vary depending on the method. There are special types of depreciation, such as bonus, special straight line, section 179. Plus, there's a different method for AMT. So businesses have to main several different books of depreciation and update them annually for each individual asset. Let's say a client places several pieces of equipment in service throughout the year. To determine the best depreciation method, they need to run a complex analysis. When was it purchased? Was it new? Was it used? What was the total amount purchased? Depending on the purchase date, they may be entitled to 50% depreciation. Maybe it's 100%. If they purchase too much equipment, Section 179 isn't available. If they don't earn enough money, Section 179 is limited. The best depreciation method may not be clear without extensive analysis. My second point is uncertainty in the tax law. Many of the changes passed last year were designed to help employ more workers, help small businesses improve cash flow, and improve the economy. For example, the HIRE Act that passed last March provided an incentive to hire unemployed workers. This legislation was time sensitive. If taxpayers did no, not know of the new incentive, the tax saving opportunity was permanently lost. The increased use of temporary provisions has also created some uncertainty. While some measures may be appropriate for the short term, temporary tax provisions and incentives have become far too common. Often they are allowed to expire, then they're revived after much debate, but only for another temporary period. It's inefficient and ineffective to make long-standing tax policy utilizing temporary provisions. Additionally, when changes occur late in the year, small business owners have little time to evaluate the impact of those changes on their businesses. It's even harder to plan when the new tax law takes effect in the same year that it's issued. In that case, a small business owner can't do long-term planning for growth, business development, or new hiring. It can be difficult to change course in response to a new short-term expiring tax provision. The third issue I'd like to highlight is the need to consider expansion of corporate provisions to help non-corporate entities. The Small Business Jobs Act passed last September expanded an existing provision to allow 100% gain exclusion on the sale of small business stock if certain conditions were met. There are several requirements to qualify for this exclusion. It must be a C corporation of a qualifying business. The stock cannot exceed a certain value and must be held for more than five years. The key here is that this provision only benefits C corporations. So it excludes many small businesses that are conducted as sole proprietors or pass-through entities. This is an excellent example of a provision that was helped designed, or I'm sorry, was intended to help small business that will likely not have the desired impact. One final note, I would encourage you to review two of our recent publications, one on alternatives for tax reform, and the other is our report on penalty reform. Both are available online and links are provided in our written testimony. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I will be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. And came in under, under time as well. Mr. Tarney, welcome. Chairman T. Berry, Ranking Member Neal, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to appear before you today to discuss the issue of fundamental tax reform, particularly as it relates to small businesses. I am the Chief Financial Officer and a minority owner of Lake Erie Electric, a position I've held since 1987, and a former board member of the Ohio Society of Certified Public Accountants. I'm speaking today on behalf of both Lake Erie Electric and the OSCPA. 
Lake Erie Electric, based in Cleveland, Ohio, is an electrical contracting company that was first formed as a C corporation in the 1950s to primarily serve industrial customers in the automotive and steel sectors of the Midwest. My company has seen many changes since its inception, both in terms of its corporate structure and business strategies. In 1987, we modified the corporate structure of the company to a pass-through subchapter S corporation due to federal tax law changes that occurred at that time and because it was a better fit for us. When Cleveland's industrial base contracted, we transition, transitioned our customer base to be more heavily weighted to commercial businesses and the healthcare sector. The main message I want to deliver to you today, gentlemen, is that simplifying the tax code for small businesses means creating jobs in places like Cleveland, Ohio. Predictability and stability within the tax code provides businesses, particularly small businesses, which typically have tighter profit margins, the necessary lens with which to make decisions regarding growth, investment or reinvestment of capital, and expanding new employee job opportunities. Further, a simpler tax code means small business owners can spend less time on costly and burdensome compliance activities and invest more of their time on innovation and growing their businesses. Simplicity also helps to minimize taxpayer confusion over exactly what liability is owed and help with financial planning for the future. Tax reform for small business is about one thing in America, jobs for all business sectors. Subchapter S corporations are structured so that net income or losses to the business are distributed to the shareholders of the company and are reflected on the individual's federal, state, and even local income tax returns. The tax is assessed at their individual income tax rates, meaning legislature should be conscious that discussions of assessing the higher tax rates on individuals at the $200,000 level and families at the $250,000 level will have a direct impact on the ability of many small business owners to reinvest in their businesses and to keep or grow their workforce. In addition to subchapter S corporations, other forms of pass-through entities that will be similarly impacted are limited liability companies, partnerships, limited liability partnerships, and sole proprietorships. Roughly 75% of small businesses are pass-through entities. As we know, the primary reason there are so many pass-through entities is because double taxation is eliminated, first at the entity level as earnings, and then again at the individual level as dividend payments to shareholders. This data leaves little doubt that in order for a significant economic recovery to take place, there must be a tax structure in place that will give small businesses the incentive to hire and thrive. Tax law does matter to small business pass-through entities because they modify business practices to adjust for law changes. In recent years, tax law changes have become a political tool with revisions occurring far too often, sometimes more than once a year and sometimes so late in the year that it is retroactive in impact, causing business owners to be confused and uncertain on how to proceed. The frequency of tax law changes affects small businesses in particular because of the unpredictability often slows or discourages the hiring or rehiring of employees or investing in new capital or other products and services. While certainly businesses of all sizes are impacted by the frequency of tax law changes, they have a far greater impact on small business decisions because so many of them operate on very tight profit margins. Predictability helps to keep costs down as fewer changes equate to fewer compliance costs associated to changing practices and procedures that in many cases are longstanding and successful from a cost benefit standpoint. Lower costs equals greater ability to reinvest in compliance company and future growth. The current structure of pass-through entities such as subchapter S corporations provides flexibility and control to small business owners and should be maintained in any tax reform proposal. Going forward, tax reform should help small business by for reforming issues such as simplifying compliances rules regarding e-filing, e-verify, shifting the burden away from being the watchdog for various government entities on its employees, reforming the timing requirements for S corporation formations, increasing the amount of small business, small businesses may expense on the federal tax returns, reasonable independent contractor rules. Gentlemen, the alternative minimum tax should be eliminated. If it can't be eliminated, enact a more reasonable and consistent threshold 
for the alternative minimum tax. In a related matter, I do applaud your efforts to address the expanded 1099 requirements currently on schedule to become effective January in 2012. From a small business perspective, this is the classic example of a compliance cost on both businesses and the Internal Revenue Service outweighing the benefits derived. Mr. Tarney, if you can wrap up. I am right now. Thank you. Meaningful tax reform that focuses on simplicity, predictability, and fairness that includes an emphasis on the related costs and compliance for in the small business is critically important so that we as small business owners do our part to grow the economy. On behalf of both Lake Erie and the Ohio Society of CPAs, I appreciate the opportunity to share my concerns and would welcome any questions you have. Thank you. Mr. Marin. Great, thank you. Uh, Chairman T. Berry, Ranking Member Neal, uh, members of the committee, subcommittee, uh, thank you for inviting me to appear today to discuss the tax system in small business. Uh, America's tax system is needlessly complex, economically harmful, and often unfair. Because of a plethora of temporary tax cuts, it's increasingly unpredictable. And it fails at its most basic task, which is raising enough money to pay our government's bills. For all those reasons, the time has come for fundamental tax reform. Such reform could have far-reaching effects on every participant in the economy, including small businesses. To provide a foundation for thinking about these effects, my testimony discusses basic facts about the relationship between tax policy and small business. I make six main points. First, today's tax code generally favors small businesses over larger ones. Provisions such as Section 179 expensing, graduated corporate tax rates, and special low capital gains taxes benefit businesses that are small in terms of investment, income, or assets. Second, many small businesses also benefit from the opportunity to organize as pass-through entities. As corporations, limited liability companies, partnerships, and sole proprietorships all avoid the double taxation that applies to income earned by C-corporations. Third, the benefits of organizing as a pass-through are not limited to small businesses. Some large businesses adopt these forms as well. Although these large firms account for a tiny share of pass-through entities, they represent a substantial, substantial fraction of pass-through economic activity. For example, only 0.3% of S-corporations had revenues above $50 million in 2005, but they accounted for more than a quarter of S-corporation income. The situation is even more extreme with partnerships. Only 0.2% of partnerships had revenues above $50 million, but they accounted for 57% of partnership income. Lawmakers should therefore take care not to assume that all pass-throughs are small businesses. Fourth, small businesses face disproportionately high costs in complying with the tax code. They are also more likely to understate their income and underpay their taxes. High compliance costs thus disadvantage responsible small businesses while the greater opportunity to evade taxes can advantage less responsible ones. Fifth, an ideal tax system would collect enough revenue to pay for government services while minimizing distortions to economic activity. To the extent possible, economic fundamentals, not tax considerations, should drive business decisions about organizational structure. By treating pass-throughs and C-corporations differently, our current tax system deviates from that ideal. Sixth and finally, uh, in discussing reform proposals, it is important to distinguish between businesses, a broad category that includes pass-throughs, and corporations, which generally means C-corporations. Many tax reform proposals would reduce business tax preferences and use the resulting revenue to cut corporate income tax rates. Such revenue-neutral re reforms could lessen the disparity in tax treatment between pass-throughs and C-corporations. Pass-throughs would see their tax burden increase, since they would lose some tax preferences, but not benefit from the rate reduction, while C-corporations would, on average, see their taxes decline. Thank you. I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Mr. Tarney, in your written testimony and briefly in your verbal testimony, you mentioned a couple things I'd like you to expand on, if you could. You mentioned simplifying compliance rules regarding e-filing and e-verify. And you also mentioned shifting the burden away from small businesses to be the watchdog for government on their employees. Can you expand on both of those issues? Uh, E-verifying uh, in our business sector, since uh, our labor force comes from uh, the unions, we have e em employees that come and go during the course of the year, and every time they come on, we have to e-verify. So you can have an employee, an electrician, for example, that comes on the payroll for three, uh, let's say three weeks, four weeks, three months, and then it goes back to the labor force because we don't need that employee anymore. 
Well, the next time he comes on, we once again have to go through the e-verify process, and we have to do that within three days of him being on the payroll. But when we do that, and since we have roughly four or 500 uh, electricians, and they rotate, uh, we could have a, this, that same employee uh, being e-verified three or four times a year. It's time consuming and it takes away from uh, other opportunities. And the other issue? E-filing, e uh, we haven't had much to do with e-filing, e but I know for small businesses it can be very difficult simply because many of the small businesses are not that, I'm going to call it technologically, uh, have that technological abilities. And your point about being a watchdog, small businesses being... Well, that, that isn't just at the federal level. That's in all levels of government. Garnishments, uh, withholdings, uh, uh, support, child support. It, it goes throughout. <laughs> it's a tremendous burden. Thank you. Dr. Carroll, if Congress decides to reduce business tax expenditures and cut the corporate tax rate, what are some ways that we could mimic a, a corporate tax rate cut for non-corporate businesses? I, I would note, and I know you are aware, for example, that the House Republican Pledge to America proposes a 20 percent deduction for small business income, which would, uh, I believe, be a similar rate cut from 35 percent to 28 percent for small businesses. Can you give us some thoughts on that? Yeah, sh sure. Um, I think there are a couple of ways that that could, could be accommodated in, in our current tax system. One, one approach would be to put in place a separate rate schedule similar to dividends and capital gains. Another approach would be to put in a deduction for a certain fraction of, uh, char, char, uh, of, of, of flow through income. One of the complexities in extending uh, a deduction or uh, a lower rate uh, to flow through income uh, might be um, trying to split between, split up um, the return to labor and return to capital associated with that income. For S corporations, it's fairly, uh, it's more straightforward, I would say. Um, S corporations are, are required to pay the owners a reasonable level of compensation, but for other organizational forms, um, such as, uh, you know, you, one would have to address that issue. Some of the Nordic countries have um, tried to split up labor, the return to labor and return to to capital, but it's a, they've come up with very, very complicated um, approaches for that. Uh, last question, and if you could all just comment on this. Uh, some have said that if we can lower the rate and broaden the base and get rid of some of the other stuff uh, within the tax code to simplify it, Ms. Thompson, starting with you, what would be a ballpark figure that you think you could lower rates for pass-through entities and get rid of some of the things that might benefit some pass through entities, but not all? The AICPA actually doesn't take a position on the best alternative to come up with, but what they have is the report talks about reform alternatives for the 21st century. And what they think about when evaluating the tax reform proposals, they'd want to look for simplicity within the measure, whether it's fair, whether it has economic growth and efficiency, its neutrality, whether it's transparent to everybody, uh, whether, or not, whether or not it's minimizing the non-compliance, because we all know that that is a significant issue, and the easier you make something, the more compliant people will be. Whether it has the ability to have cost-effective collection um, and the impact on the government revenues, whether there's certainty in it, and whether there's payment um, convenience. So the AICPA really, at this point, doesn't have a position to answer your question on it. But if proposals come up, we could take a look at them and, and see what We could probably is. move your bill right now, actually. I think everyone agrees with what you've said. Mr. Tarney. Uh, sim simplicity and predictability for a small business is essential so that they know <laughs> what to do moving forward. As we all know in small businesses, uh, uh, it's usually the owner that it leads it, and he's not necessarily the key in financial decision making. That's why many times the CFO is known as an OFO, the only financial officer. Um, if you make it simple and predictable, a small business owner begins to understand it. 
and he can make decisions in his structure, in his decision making, so that he can expand his business. It, it's as simple as that. Mr. Marin. I was, I was uh, quite impressed with uh, where the President's Fiscal Commission came out. Uh, I served on a parallel uh, Domenici Rivlin Commission. Both of those d did full scale tax reform, right? Individual and corporate at the same time. Uh, and in both of those, they came out in roughly the same place of saying that we should aspire to a system where both the top corporate rate and the top individual rate are the same and begin with it too. And it's kind of, you know, 27, 28, somewhere in there. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Carroll. Yeah, I, I would just following on. Um, uh, Dr. Marin's comments, we, um, both the, the, Fis the Fiscal Commission and the Rivlin Commission got down to about a 27, 28 percent. Um, they uh, would eliminate most, if not all, um, business tax expenditures. Depending on the plan, they kept a few things. Um, if you go back to the 2007 uh, Treasury uh, competitiveness uh, report, we were able to get the rate at that time down to about the same. If you eliminated all business tax expenditures, you could get the rate down to about 20, 27, 28, 8 percent. And that, that includes getting rid of um, uh, provisions like accelerated depreciation. Um, and so some pr provisions that are longstanding and, and, and certainly uh, are widely used. And one of the things I think you need to also consider is, is uh, when you add in the state rates, uh, even if you got the, the business rate down to 28 percent for corporations and for flow-throughs, um, when you add in state rates, the, you would still have a rate uh, on the order of about 33 um, uh, percent combined rate for the U.S., which would still place us uh, at a, com uh, a rate above uh, the OECD and the, and the G7. Thank you. Thank you all. I will yield for questioning to the ranking member, Mr. Neal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Marin, both you and Dr. Carroll discussed the problem with eliminating business tax preferences as part of an effort to lower the corporate rate. In fact, Dr. Carroll's testimony highlights the annual cost of these and which ones are used equally by both corporations and pass-throughs. Since base broadening, though, seems to be the best way to accomplish reform, how do you think that Congress should address this real concern? The, well, I'd, I'd start with broad principles, right, and kind of the broad, you know, from the security of being a think tank economist kind of guy, right, the number one principle I start with is sort of a leveling the playing field that to first order the goal of our tax system should be not to play favorites among different types of activities, different organizational forms. And that when you have business tax preferences that are clearly skewing the field in one direction or another, that those are ones that ought to get close, close attention. Uh, a second one, and this one I want to highlight just because it doesn't come up as much, we often talk about a strategy of uh, rolling back tax preferences, lowering rates as a strategy for doing corporate reform. Uh, in business reform. There is another strategy which is to, uh, to keep favorable depreciation policies, possibly even move more towards expensing, but then pay for that by walking back the uh, deductibility of interest. And an attraction, I would recommend that as a strategy to keep in mind because the attraction of that is that it would eliminate some of the distortions in our current system that favor leverage and favor debt. Uh, and in principle could be a way that would have favorable investment incentives, uh, but in a paid for way. Mm -hmm. Dr. Carroll. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the challenge is um, there's been some discussion of corporate reform focused on trying to bring the corporate rate down, primarily uh, due to the pressures from abroad with uh, the corporate rates coming down quite a lot over the last couple of decades um, among our major trading partners. Um, and I think uh, you know, tax reform, I think uh, business tax reform needs to be somewhat more broadly considered. I think it's very hard to um, uh, lower the corporate rate and pay for that uh, by repealing uh, all business tax expenditures or some set of uh, business tax expenditures for both flow-throughs as well as, as uh, C corporations. I think one needs to pursue um, not just reform of the corporate income tax, but more broadly reform of the business tax system and look at that in a more holistic fashion. And the, the tax system is, is very intertwined. There are a lot of, um, it, there are a lot of interrelationships uh, between, as I've discussed in my written testimony, between C corporations in the flow through sector, but also uh, in the taxation of uh, investor level income in the form of capital gains and dividends, which the, the, the part of the double tax on corporate profits. These things are very interrelated and it's, I think it's very difficult to take a small piece of the tax code and try to reform that in, in isolation. I think it's pursuing it in a much broader way is, is um, more constructive. Mm -hmm. uh, off script for a moment, uh, but it, it, a few moments ago in your comments you, you spoke to uh, depreciation allowance. 
while I think in my own instance, having rejected the idea, the theology that tax cuts pay for themselves, I, I do subscribe to the notion, as Chairman Tiberi offered at the outset, that the use of the NOL last year was very important, further suggesting that at certain times some, some tax cuts are better than others. And I think there's some evidence over the years that acceleration of depreciation allowance has worked in terms of changing behavior in an economic downturn. So are you prepared to suggest that that ought to be eliminated as a possibility? Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not really um, here to suggest what should be eliminated or, or kept. Uh, with respect to accelerated depreciation and expensing, I think it's a, a, a pretty common view among economists that the expensing and accelerated depreciation are um, uh, constructive provisions that uh, help encourage investment. Um, both in times of um, uh, uh, economic downturns, the bonus depreciation and 100% expensing enacted uh, in, in late December can be very constructive to help stimulate uh, business investment during periods of, of economic weakness. But it's also, I think, very um, helpful in, in terms of longer term uh, tax policy. Um, accelerated depreciation and expensing help move the tax system yeah, tax help reduce the uh, the tax on capital income in the economy, which can help uh, encourage capital formation and and promote growth in the longer term. And uh, <coughs> Ms. Thompson, it was dizzying just to read your client scenarios with all the complex depreciation options, but I'm sure you understand that Congress was trying to help small business, even though the result was a patchwork of generous rates and confusing expiration dates. And I share the argument that the four of you seem to be unified around based upon predictability. That, that's a given. But since you mentioned how tax accounting here differs from financial accounting, is conformity a recommendation that you would make? We're not really saying that the tax rules need to be the same as the financial accounting rules, but what we're thinking is that it's just one area that can be analyzed to see if it can be made easier and it can be more predictable because as we had said during 2010, there were quite a few tax provisions that came in and actually were changing depreciation. So it just adds to the complexity of it. I don't think that anybody is opposed to accelerated depreciation. My small business clients aren't, but they'd like to know ahead of time and so that they could have time to plan for it. So that's really what they're asking for. And just lastly, uh, Mr. English and I at one time worked on that, as you know, and uh, there was substantial evidence that it was an effective approach, and certainly uh, <coughs> tax receipts were up based upon that initiative. Thank you, Mr. Neal. Mr. Heller is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your uh, comments uh, and uh, hold this hearing. Appreciate all of you being here. Um, I, I, I'm from Nevada, so when you think of Nevada, a lot of times you think of gaming properties and. Uh, and, and I can understand that, but uh, I think the fact remains that uh, small businesses make up uh, almost 96% of the, of, of the employers in Nevada. And just some other statistics, only because I think Nevada um, is a microcosm of what's going out economically, going on economically in the country as a whole. In 2004, 2005, we created uh, nearly 68,000 new small business jobs. In 2005 to 2006, we created 77,000, so an increase uh, uh, of nearly 10,000. But in 2006, 2007, uh, going from uh, 77,000, it was reduced to 40,000 uh, new small business jobs. And uh, clearly, economic factors have everything to do with it. In uh, 2009, Nevada averaged 3,300 new small business startups each quarter. The downside is, is that we average 3,700 small businesses being closed each quarter. So clearly, uh, uh, those that are closing uh, uh, are, are unfortunately outpacing those new jobs that are being created. In the uh, Obama uh, fiscal year 2012 budget, he raises uh, taxes on small businesses. Uh, he does it in three ways. He raises the top two individual income tax rates. Uh, from 33% to 36% and then from 35% to 39.6%. He uh, reinstates the personal exemption phase out uh, and the, uh, the P's limitations on itemized deductions and finally he raises taxes on dividends and long-term capital gains, hoping to raise in his budget 709 
$1.5 billion. Now, the theme, and, and I appreciate uh, Mr. Tarmay's uh, comments about what businesses need, um, and I think it's been a theme for all of you, and that's predictability, uh, stability, and simplicity. I guess my question, uh, uh, Ms. Thompson, since you uh, uh, alluded to these issues and the importance of planning, long-term planning, as you know, last year uh, we extended the 2001-2003 tax cuts uh, for only two years. And you were talking about the ability of a small business to be able to plan long term, a five year plan, a 10 year plan. With this, with, with, with these increased, potential increased taxes of $709 billion and the extension for only two years, those 2001 three and 2003 tax extension, how does a small business today put together a five year plan or put together a 10 year plan? They don't, or they can't because you're absolutely right. It was very helpful that the 2001 tax rates were extended for a two-year two period. But what we would like to see is to know either this year or as soon as we can what the rates are going to be beyond 2012. So it will help that small business owner know what his tax liability is going to be in the future because if he knows that his taxes are going to increase, it's going to have an impact on his cash flow. If it has an impact on his cash flow, there's going to be Pro potentially cuts in other areas, and unfortunately that might be workers. It's hard to say, but they will definitely need to know what their tax liability is going in the future to make the business decisions now. Mr. Torme, since those were your words, predictability, simplicity, and uh, stability, how, how does a business today plan under the current tax rates that we have? I would agree. It's very difficult because uh, for years, for decades, it used to be we understood what the tax rates were, what the law was moving forward, accelerated depreciation, the whole nine yards. Then I would say in the past 10 to 15 years, laws change annually, sometimes retro. It's very, very difficult for small businesses to do that. They have to bring in their uh, experts, their tax advisors, and that's costly. If, they, if small business owners understood what it's going to be for a five-year period, a 10-year period, they can plan. That's what they're good at. That's what we need. The um, President's Deficit Reduction Commission, um, is there anything that you disagreed with? There's a lot of tax structural changes, uh, uh, talking about deductions and, and removing uh, uh, Dr. Marion. Uh, you're, you're talking about uh, moving forward with a different type of tax structure. What in the uh, President's uh, Deficit Reduction Commission, were there any principles in there that you agreed or disagreed with? You said you had a similar, uh, you sat on a similar commission yourself. Yes, the, uh, so in terms of things agreed with, uh, very much endorsed the idea that if you're gonna do reform, A, it makes sense to do the whole tax system at once if you possibly can politically, uh, to take into account all of the interactions. Uh, that uh, there are a lot of tax preferences out there that really look a lot like spending programs. They've just been dressed up to appear as tax cuts. Mm -hmm. And that as a result, if, if, someone, if someone's interested in making the government smaller, there are actually some things you can do that will be recorded as tax increases that actually are functionally the reduction of spending from any sort of economic or budget point of view. And that as a result, some of the, you know, there are ways basically to increase revenues that, you know, are not that troubling, frankly. Um, the, very much encouraged by the bringing down rates, kind of broaden the base, uh, lower the rates. Um, as, as Dr. Carroll mentioned, you know, a little bit of concern that the plans uh, do raise dividend rates and capital gains rates. Uh, and so there's an issue that while for the corporate form you're reducing uh, rates with one hand, on the other hand you're raising rates on the other hand and you're not getting as much of a net uh, incentive for investment as you might get with a slightly different form. Thank you. I've run out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Roskam is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, the good news is uh, we all agree on something, and we all agree that the status quo has got to change. There's no voice here on this panel, and there's no voice among the witnesses that says, let's, let's stick with the status quo. And that is actually good news. I mean, there's a shared premise that we can move forward from. What I'm interested, you know, we're all products of our environment, and we're all reflecting our districts today. Mr. Heller talked about Nevada. I'm from suburban Chicago, and my district has an extraordinary number 
of manufacturers, small manufacturers, tool and die, you know, types that are that are selling into foreign markets and are selling around the world, selling to the caterpillars of the world and so forth. Illinois has a unique dynamic that I'm concerned about. It's nothing that, that we're going to do about anything about today. It was a bad decision, I think, that was made. But it's having an impact on this larger conversation about pass-throughs. Let me just give you a qu couple of quick facts on Illinois. Uh, Illinois just raised its taxes, right? So um, the individual rate went from 3 to 5 percent, a 67 percent increase. The corporate income tax rate went from 7.3 to 9.5, a 30 percent tax increase. Illinois now has the fourth highest combined uh, national local corporate income tax rate. And according to the Tax Foundation, we've dropped from 23 to 36th in the country among states. Now, that's not your problem. That's my problem because I'm an Illinois resident. But it's also the problem of a lot of companies and businesses that I represent. So if we're making changes at a macro level in terms of U.S. tax policy that have an impact on driving more businesses into a corporate structure, you see what that does to the employers that I represent. They're jammed, right? They've got to they've go into this position. And what we don't want to do is move them so that they have to go that route. Dr. Carroll, I'm interested in your perspective. Um, a lot of times when we talk about corporate tax rates and sort of corporate tax conversations or general tax reform, we, we, we tend to shun pass-throughs as, as a little bit of a sideshow. You mentioned three key points, and I just want to yield you some time. Could you go through those key factors on the, the distortions um, w within the marketplace, the, the debt equity um, distortions and so forth? Because I think that's an important part of the calibration that this subcommittee needs to take into consideration as we move forward. Yeah, as I mentioned in my oral statement and the written test, and I explain in some detail in the written uh, testimony, one of the major differences between being the taxation in the, as a C corporation as a, and as a flow through is the double tax on corporate profits. The notion that a, if you, a dollar of investment in the corporate sector is for the return to that investment is first subject to the corporate income tax and then taxed again at the individual level, uh, either when it's paid out as a dividend or if the, in, in, in the return is retained, then it would be taxed as a capital gain uh, eventually when the shareholder disposes of the stock. So when you combine those two levels of tax, you wind up with a double tax. And that, that distorts economic decision making, decision making in a couple of ways. Um, Dr. Marin had mentioned that uh, economic fun fundamentals should drive um, decision making, not tax considerations. One of the things that the corporate tax does because it's a tax on equity finance investment. Interest expenses are deductible, but dividends are not. And so it's a tax on equity finance investment, which creates a bias or adds to the bias for debt financed investment. It increases the leverage uh, within, overall leverage within the economy um, to the extent that firms are more highly leveraged. Because of this tax bias, they're gonna be more susceptible to financial distress during times of, of economic weakness. So that's one of the distortions, the tax bias for, for debt finance, the tax bias for greater leverage, that's, that's an issue. Um, another uh, issue is um, you have a treatment, uh, a different treatment of investment in the corporate sector versus elsewhere in the economy, in the non-corporate sector and housing, other sectors in the economy. And that causes a misallocation of capital within the economy. Um, Again, you have uh, investment decisions throughout the economy being made by uh, for tax considera considerations, not economic fundamentals. When you have that misallocation of capital, uh, the, the capital stock will not be allocated to its best and highest uh, use. Um, uh, and that's going to reduce um, economic growth. Um, and then third, it raises the cost of capital. The, the, the uh, double tax on corporate profits is a, a second, you know, it's another layer of tax on, on capital formation that, that, um, that higher cost of capital discourages capital formation and investment and again would reduce the, uh, the overall growth rate of the economy. Thanks, Dr. Carroll. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Thompson is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this hearing and thanks to all the witnesses for being here. And 
I concur with everyone else who said that this is an issue that we all agree on. We just need to figure out uh, how to get there. Um, just a real quick question, uh, Ms. Thompson. Uh, on the 1099 issue that, that you raised, um, do, you, do you have any suggestions on how uh, this Congress should deal with the underlying issues that brought the 1099 matter to the forefront, and that is the $30 billion or $25 billion worth of tax evasion that's going on? How do you capture, how do you address that? I think that would probably be on an enforcement side, which the IRS does have the ability to. But they don't have the data. It's hard for them to, you can't put an IRS person at every purchase, play every point of purchase. I think that the existing rules that are in place cover services. And I don't think that everybody is in, even in compliance with that one. So we might start working on that area first. I think the way the legislation is written right now, it's covering goods and it's covering corporations. And that's not realistic on how you're going to solve the problem. The example that everybody's talking about is if a small business owner goes into Staples and purchases their office supplies and they happen to spend more than $600 in a year, they're going to be required to send a 1099 to Walmart and Staples. And it just doesn't seem like it's the right target that you're looking for. Um, on the uh, issue, a couple of you have raised the whole issue of complexity. And uh, uh, for those of us who were in the uh, meeting that we had, I think yesterday, the, the full committee, uh, when we got the briefing on all the tax structure, it's pretty hard to argue that the system isn't just overwhelmingly complex. Um, and in another life, I chaired a tax committee in the state legislature in, in California. And I had uh, business people tell me, just you know, lower the heck out of our taxes, and we understand things need to be uh, revenue neutral. You need money to do all the things that, that government does. But the lower our tax rate is, the more people will hire, the higher wages will pay, the better everybody off will be. Get it at the employee, uh, and we're paying them well. You know, they should they they should uh, pay taxes. Do you, do you think that's a pretty accurate uh, approach? Do we have too many? to any of you. Do we have too many tax options for business? I think Mr. Neal said it uh, earlier that uh, it, it's complex, but everything that's there that makes it complex was there to address a certain issue or in most cases to help business. Uh, do, we, do, do businesses have too many uh, tax options on the table? Uh, the answer is yes. The, also the answer is if it can be done so that uh, the law is something that people can understand for a significant period of time as opposed to things changing year to year or less than five years. People can plan that. I can plan it. My company can plan that. We understand that. We can move forward. Okay. That's the difficulty we have. And the other thing is simply law changes that are retroactive. When you hear that, you don't do things because you don't know when, when that retroactive application is. If we knew that, we can plan. That's what we need. So if there were fewer options, if you didn't have the LLC, you didn't have the corp stuff, you didn't have you know, just a business tax? Well, I, I'm not saying the type of entity. I'm saying within that type of entity that you understand what the law is, it's simple, it's fair, it's I get that part. That's it. Yeah. I, I guess I, I would say that um, I think one of the distinguishing features of the U.S. Tax, business tax system is we do afford uh, companies with businesses with different choices on how to organize themselves. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought of that as a, as a virtue. It allows companies to make the choice that best fits and suits their capital requirements and their management needs. It's probably one of the, the many distinguishing features of the U.S. economy in comparison to our major, major trading partners. That flex, flexibility probably adds to the dynamism of the U.S. US economy. So, uh, to follow up on that, uh, Dr. Carroll, uh, are there certain anti-avoidance measures that would have to be put in place if you were to um, um, devise a, a system that pushed the rate down and, and lessened the uh, 
the, uh, the options? Yeah, that, that's a very, very inter interesting question. And it, 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 um, it's kind of an extension of your earlier question in, in some sense in terms of how tax rates um, affect decision making. It typically from an avoidance or a compliance perspective, one would think higher tax rates would encourage greater avo avoidance and, and uh, uh, non-compliance activity because the benefit of avoiding and the benefit of, of, of not complying to the taxpayer is greater with the higher rates. So one of the, the benefits of lowering rates generally would be that you would, would help uh, uh, mitigate and, and reduce uh, avoidance behavior. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Thompson, uh, just a side note, we tried to find Grandma Thompson to come testify when we couldn't. We had Miss Thompson uh, instead. Well, that's why I cautioned you. You better <laughs> lay off the Grandma Thompson jokes today <laughs> because. <laughs> Mr. Paulson is uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, it's nice to be having a hearing that's focused on small business entities and I appreciate your testimony here today. And knowing that uh, we're in a very globally competitive economy, absolutely. and. You know, today we have to have a tax code that has not only the predictability and the long-term thinking, but I mean, I really do believe it also has to spur innovation, spur the whole idea of entrepreneurship and also capital formation and investment. I think there's a lot of members that are in, staff people are in the administration or even members of Congress that don't understand the allocation of capital. And that's really what this is about, is how you allocate capital uh, in a global environment. You know, w one of my concerns with the administration's proposal on tax reform recently is that it it's centered more on the corporate tax side, at least in the President's State of the Union proposal, and he talks more about having a revenue, ba revenue neutral basis for corporate tax reform, and I want to make sure that that's not going to be an expensive trap for small business entities and pass-through entities such as S-Corps, LLCs, the sole proprietorships, partnerships, et cetera. And, you know, if, if that's the track that is ultimately pursued and, you know, a lot of our nation's employers are going to see tax increases because we eliminated certain tax business, uh, the expenditure side, like deductions for depreciation, depreciation, et cetera, which we talked about. You know, what would be some of the ramifications of that from the standpoint of, uh, well, I'm worried there might not be any offsetting benefit, in essence, for a lot of the small employers. And on top of this, actually, we also heard the Secretary Geithner actually just last week, I think, float the idea of having some pass-throughs be pushed more into the C corporation model, actually, ensuring they also would be hit with this inefficient double tax. So let me just ask Mr. Carroll first, maybe, um, you know, if, if the purpose is tax reform is to actually make the U.S. government more competitive, or our economy more competitive, I should say, and encourage job creation. Does it make sense to push more people into the C corporation tax model? I, 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 my, my view is that's, that's problematic. Um, as I've, I've already discussed, the have a double tax on corporate profits. It distorts uh, decision making in some fairly fundamental ways. It's kind of widely recognized um, let's say among economists or in the policy community that the double tax on corporate profits is a significant problem. It contributes to the leverage uh, in, in among businesses. Uh, it, it, it misallocates capital and it raises the overall cost of capital for the economy. Most other nations, um, developed nations, have provided some relief from the double tax on corporate profits in some way. They've shifted a little bit uh, in the last 10 years in how they do that, whether they do it at the shareholder level whether, you know, whether they do it at the corporate level, uh, the mechanism in which, which they deliver it. Um, but the U.S. Is, is, tends to have a, a fairly, uh, uh, even after the lower rates on dividends and capital gains were enacted in 2003, we still have a, a fairly high double tax uh, on corporate profits such that a dollar of investment in the corporate sector that's paid out as dividends is, is taxed pretty highly relative to, to uh, you know, most, other, most other things. I think that's, that's a, a problem. It, it kind of complicates, I, and I think it really complicates if you try to redraw the line between the, the, the flow-through sector and the C-corporation sector to, in the, in, to raise more revenue uh, to lower the corporate rate. Um, I, I think it would um, uh, it would make the double tax uh, problem larger, not yeah. smaller. And Ms. Thompson, I'm just curious, what, what would happen to your clients if they got pushed into a C-Corp model? I think it's really too early to say what would happen if they moved into the corporate form because we haven't, it hasn't been worked out on what all the details of that are. Are there going to be changes to the expenses? Is there going to be a double tax? So it's really too early to answer that question. Okay. And 
Mr. Chairman, I'll follow up on a different angle, too, with Mr. Carroll. I, I know you've looked at the economic issues that are associated with S-corporations and with a subset of S-corporations, namely employee-owned or ESOP S-corporations in particular. And these are companies that essentially, you know, that are employer-owned, and they fared much better in tough economic times in terms of actually growing their companies in t in, in, during these trying times and also putting people back to work, providing retirement security, actually, uh, for their employees. If the administration's proposal, you know, to move and eliminate some of these pass-throughs on S-Corps became a reality, for instance, what would this mean for privately uh, employee-owned companies, potentially? Um, yeah, or I, or who, who would be affected by such changes within those organizations? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the S-Corp uh, ESOP structure um, is, is, is very interesting. It, um, the employee ownership aspect is, is very interesting. And, and the performance of those companies, based on, on some work that I, I've done, suggests that those companies performed better uh, during the economic downturn um, uh, than, than kind of the rest of the economy. In a sense, although it's not a huge segment of the economy, they, they did, in effect, uh, provide, uh, in some sense, a backstop during the, uh, the economic downturn. They tend to pay their workers higher, higher average wages. Um, uh, and they, they tend to provide a fairly high level of retirement security, so the ESOP provides that, that benefit as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Berg is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate you being here. As a small businessman, it's kind of over the years, uh, going through the 86 tax reform and everything else, it's, you know, small business tends to make decisions uh, first of all, on the economics, but they're really influenced by the taxation. And it seems to me when it, I, I enjoyed the, uh, the OFO, only financial officer. I mean, I think that's what a lot of these small businesses are. And, mm -hmm. and when there's laws that are passed that are a little convoluted or complicated, you know, they're trying to look at that and figure that out. And the point of having a third party analyze this for the business, I mean, those are things that again, specifically help at uh, little moments in time, but I think overall really cause a, uh, a lack of focus in what maybe a small business should be focused on. And so one of the things that I've heard you saying that, uh, that potentially when you eliminate some of the accelerated depreciation and other things that you could probably bring the rate down to 27, 28 percent. I wonder if you've ever looked at just the silo of pass-through entities. And if you said, just looking at this group of pass-through entities, if we eliminated, again, or, or changed this to simplify it, what could that overall rate be brought down to? Would, would that be the 28 percent? Again, whoever would like to. Yeah, I think if you were, if you were um, looking at just the flow-through sector by itself, I, I haven't done the calculation in terms of how low the rate could be brought down. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, flow-through entities uh, use about 22 percent of the business tax expenditures, um, and they uh, report about 40 percent of the net income and pay about 43 percent of the business taxes. So in that sense, the C corporation, C corporations kind of make greater use, somewhat greater use of, of a business tax uh, expenditures. So that might give you some sense of kind of the relative reduction of the rates. But I would point out that if if, um, if one tried to just do corporate reform and and try to draw a line in, in the various business tax expenditures or business tax provisions so that they would only be um, reduced or eliminated for C corporations or did the same for pastors, I think that would be a very, very complex, complicated system trying to make those distinctions in something like accelerated depreciation that's broadly available to all business forms and trying to have one system for C corporations and another system for flow throughs I think would be, um, would be an extraordinarily complex um, system. The, uh, uh, Ms. Thompson, you'd mentioned the 100% uh, gain exemption and that was a little bit new to me. Could you explain uh, that briefly and how that could benefit if that were implemented for pass-through entities? The provision is that if you have a gain on the sale of a small business stock, you can exclude 100 percent as long as you purchase the stock between September 2010 and December, uh, September 2010 and December 2011. And, start, and starting in January 2012, it's going to drop down to 50 percent gain exclusion. 
But what happens with that provision right now is it's only available to C corporations. And as we had talked about, most of the small businesses are running as pass-through entities. And so if that's a C corporation provision, it automatically excludes everybody who's been running their small business as a pass-through entity. Um, the value has to be less than $50 million, and it has to be in certain types of businesses. And it can't be any type of personal service business. It can't be restaurant, hotels, motels, those types of things. So it's really very narrow, and it's even more narrow because it's only C-Corps, which most of the small businesses aren't. Okay, thank you. The, the other issue that's come up time and time again is the uncertainty and unpredictability. I mean, I think whatever our tax rates were, whatever our deductions were, if they were set in stone for 15 years, that would be a good thing for small business and probably all business, as long as it's competitive. And so I guess looking at that, I'm, I'm asking myself, what are the taxes out there that are on like a short-term trigger that need to be renewed that create this uncertainty out there in our, cur in our current tax code as it relates to, to the pass-through entities? Um, what are those uh, either deductions or what are those things that you're aware of that create that uncertainty that could be addressed in this Congress? Again, I'm not, I guess, directing it. The first one could absolutely be the tax rates because we do know that there's, they're set until the end of um, the next two years, 2012. But then once you get beyond that, depreciation, we do know that there's an business incentive that you put in place more when the economy isn't really good. But having that come in and out as frequently as it does, that's causing quite some challenges. Okay. <clears throat> so tax rates and depreciation, is there anything else that I think those, from add? the small business perspective, I think those are the major ones that we come across. Okay, Dr. I think if, if you look broadly at the tax system, you have a, a large fraction of the tax code that is really in flux uh, from year to year. You have the, the sunset of the Bush tax cuts at the end of 2012, which raises a, a, a considerable uncertainty. Then you also have the various expiring provisions, um, including the R&D credit that's used by, by small, uh, small businesses as well as large businesses. And uh, you know, that, that, that expires periodically. There's a long list of expiring provisions. All of these things create a lot of uncertainty and instability in the tax code and make it very, very difficult for, for uh, both individual and business taxpayers to make decisions. <coughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Berg. Dr. Bustani is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, th and thank you for holding this hearing. This is a very important hearing. You know, some time ago I was back home doing a town hall meeting and I was talking about American competitiveness and the need to lower the corporate tax rate so we can compete in a global economy. And after some lengthy discussion about all that, I had a, a small business owner who I happen to know, a gentleman by the name of Paul Fontana, who owns a, an occupational therapy uh, uh, business. And he stood up and he said, what about me? What does this get me? And got me to thinking, and I said, well, you know, you're right, because you have a pass-through entity. And as we go through this, this discussion, it, it becomes apparently clear to me that we really have to focus on our small businesses and pass-through entities as we do tax reform. Otherwise, I think we'll be negligent in the approach. Uh, Dr. Dr. Carroll and, and uh, Dr. Marin, the administration's talking about reducing the corporate tax rate, which I think we all agree we need to do. But at the same time, and we're looking at, you know, targeting it, targeting it down into the 20s, you know, 20, 25 percent, if we can get it down that low to be really competitive. But at the same time, the administration's talking about raising the, the, the top level for pass-through entities, the top rate for pass-through entities and individuals to almost 40 percent. So what's, what's going to be the economic consequence if that's allowed to go through? Dr. Carroll? Yeah, I, I think um, yeah, our, our, our corporate tax system is, is very much out of step in, in, the, in the global economy. Um, most other nations have lowered, developed nations within the OECD have lowered their corporate tax rates significantly over the last, um, certainly since the mid-1980s. And we now have the second highest corporate tax rate um, exceeded only by Japan. Japan is, is is, is likely to reduce their corporate tax rate in, in, in April, in which case we'll have the highest. So that kind of provides a backdrop for, for uh, why there's an interest in corporate tax reform. Uh, you know, we, we want the U.S. to be able to compete in a global economy, and the world's really changed. It's very different now than it was. But what's the economic consequence here in the U.S.? 
with I, this disparity, if we have a top rate of almost 40 percent for our pass-throughs and for individuals as we lower the corporate tax rate? I, I, think, I think it's very, very problematic. I think it's very problematic. Um, the flow-through sector is, uh, as I said, is a very uh, large segment of the, of the economy, it employs 54 percent of the private, uh, private labor force, a, a workforce, and to have a very different treatment of uh, pass-throughs relative to C corporations is, is, a, is a problem. Thank you. Dr. Marin? Uh, you know, I mean, again, I would go back and reference uh, what the Fiscal Commission came up with, the Dementia Rivaling Commission came up with, that there's a reason they chose in the end to try to have the top rates on the individual side and the corporate side be the same. And one of those key reasons is to avoid all the distortions that would arise. If you have one rate that's 40 and you have another that's 25, you've created a gigantic incentive for creative people to think about how do I exploit this to best advantage. And that's thinking that would be better deployed doing something else in the economy. And so if you can do fundamental reform of the entire system, but you know, that means touching all sorts of other tax preferences that are purely on the individual side and have nothing to do with business, uh, much better to end up with rates being, you know, they don't literally have to be identical, but close to each close. other. Close, yeah, thank you. And you know, one of the common refrains I hear from small business owners is about uh, the, the issue of accelerated depreciation. And we saw this after the hurricanes. It was probably the single most important thing Congress did to spur the Louisiana economy after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. And I appreciate your comments earlier, Dr. Carroll, about both the short-term and long-term consequences uh, that are positive uh, with this type of uh, approach. And uh, Ms. Thompson, in your testimony, you, you highlighted a number of the complexities, uh, the varying in rules and everything else, which I read with uh, great interest. And I'm going to look at the report that you all have as well. But how, how could tax reform simplify some of these rules uh, related to capital investment that would allow for small businesses to, to actually see capital formation? I think the best thing you could do with the depreciation is have it for a longer period of time and make it, put it in place prior to the time that you're thinking about it. For example, if you wanted it to be effective January 1, 2011, put it in place if you could in 2010 and don't have it just for a one year period, have it for a much longer period of time because then that gives the ability to the small business owner to plan their investments better, their purchases and that would really add a lot to the simplification of the system because everybody does like the accelerated, it's just that if it comes in too frequently um, at various times during the year, it's just challenging. Does anybody else want to comment on the, uh, the, the issue of depreciation uh, versus expensing? and you know, the concerns about uh, debt financing uh, before we conclude this? Oh, if I could just, just echo something I said before, which is that I'm, I'm sympathetic to approaches that would move more towards expensing if at the same time you think about walking back the deductibility of interest. Uh, otherwise, you accidentally end up in a system where if, if interest is deductible, you can have a, a situation in which we effectively have negative tax rates on capital investment, which I think is going too far. Uh, but if you, you know, keep accelerated depreciation, move towards expensing, but then think about rolling back interest deductibility, uh, you can have a system that reduces that debt equity distortion uh, and provides incentives for investment. Anybody else care to answer? Gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. Ms. Berkeley. Recognize for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Tiberi, and thank you for holding this hearing. Thank all of the witnesses. I've learned a lot this morning, and I appreciate that. I agree with my colleagues that reforming the tax system is critical to the long-term health of our economy. I don't think you need to be a genius to figure out that the tax code is bloated and it's very complex. It adds unnecessary costs to business operations and distorts business investment decisions. Um, that the code is unnecessarily complex is a complaint that I hear often uh, from my constituents in Las Vegas, and I worry that it poses an additional hurdle to my district getting back on its uh, feet economically. Um, we are in a world of hurt uh, in uh, Nevada, particularly in Las Vegas, which is the community that I represent. 
um, half of the businesses, although I know everybody thinks of Las Vegas as the glitz and the glitter and the big hotels, and in fact, that is part of our persona and has served us well until the latest economic crash, but a half of the people that are employed in the state of Nevada are employed by small businesses. So what we're talking about today is very important. I know that this is the beginning of a very long process. Um, in the state of Nevada, pass-through entities outnumber um, C corporations by almost three to one. So what we're talking about here today is very important to the people I represent. Um, there are a number of questions that I have. Um, the first one is just um, some musings. I know that we're all talking about budget neutrality and if we could bring down uh, the corporate rate to 27, 28 percent across the board, get rid of all of the um, tax extenders, the tax breaks, the tax credits, it would add to predictability and simplicity, which everybody um, believes would be better for small businesses. If you know what's happening and uh, what you can plan for 10 years from now, five years from now, obviously it, it, it uh, impacts on your business decisions and gives you an opportunity to make better ones. But um, having been through the tax extender debates and having everybody um, th that I knew that owned a business of some kind coming into my office and asking for an extension of their tax break, no matter what business they're in, if it's propane, um, gas, or, or speedways um, uh, throughout the United States, I'm wondering how willing businesses are going to, uh, to be to give up these tax breaks that we have extended over the years. And I would imagine that if we lowered the tax rate, and I agree with you, when you look at um, our tax rate on paper uh, in comparison to other industrialized countries, it seems very, very high. But when you factor in all the tax breaks, tax credits, tax extenders, I think it generally lowers our um, overall corporate tax rate dramatically. I can tell you in uh, my congressional district, without naming names specifically, I have one gaming company that pays overall about 8% after they take advantage of all their tax breaks, and I have another that's over 30, and they're both pretty big companies. Now, I wonder how the, per, uh, the company that is now paying about 8% of their taxes is going to feel when we pass legislation that kind of stabilizes everybody at around 27, 28% while eliminating the tax breaks. Can you comment on that? Yeah. Um, the there are a lot, a lot of, a lot of points that you've raised there that all, that are all, I think, very important. One, one point is, um, you know, how do we compare to other nations? And there, there are different ways of, of measuring that. We do have a high statutory corporate tax rate. Um, we also have a high, um, what economists would call a marginally effective tax rate relative, relative to, to other nations. Um, there's a, a, a recent study. Um, that was released by a, an academic in Canada, Jack Mintz, that, that makes that point. Um, we also have a very high effective tax rate, kind of measured on a financial statement basis based on some work by a, an academic, um, uh, Doug Shackelford, down in, in North Carolina. Um, I think there are a number of ways of thinking about effective tax rates or tax rates generally, and which tax rate you look at it really depends on what question you're asking. But by a number of different metrics, the U.S. Is, looks like it's, it's pretty out of step relative, relative to, to uh, other countries. So that's, I think, uh, one, one point to, uh, to keep in mind. Let me, um, uh, Mr. Marin, um, you pointed out in your testimony the connection between the complexity of the code and the tendency of small businesses to underpay their taxes. Um, can you share with us some areas of the tax code where simplification would um, have the highest effect on boosting compliance? Ah, and, uh, and in, my, in my remarks, I was very careful to, to use, uh, what was the word I used, responsible and irresponsible, right, just to distinguish, right, so small business is a whole vast array of different kinds of firms, some of which face very high compliance burdens and try to pay the taxes they do, and then unfortunately there are other ones who are, who are able to, to avoid. Um, you know, unfortunately, I don't have any good recommendations for you. I mean, again, some of these things have to do with, you know, cash transactions, which are hard to monitor. 
Uh, it's just sort of, you know, a fundamental nature of some of these transactions that they're going to be more difficult to reach to. Uh, obviously, there was the effort with the 1099, which has gotten a lot of understandable pushback in that it's, it's the burdens it placed on folks seems to be disproportionate uh, to the additional revenue it's going to raise. Uh, maybe some of my colleagues have some suggestions for you, but I do not. Sorry. Well, the gentlelady's time has expired, but any of the other witnesses care to Thank answer you. her question? So no suggestions on how we can, in fact, of what we can do with the tax code where simplification uh, would have the highest effect on compliance? No help? <laughs> the gentlelady's time has expired. We're going to go <laughs> Thank one. You. You're, you're welcome. We're going to go one more round uh, if the witnesses wouldn't uh, care to, would care to indulge us for just one question from each of the members if they wish. And I'll start out by uh, asking all four of you, uh, well, two of you a question and then I'll follow up with the other two. Earlier this week, in a publication called Tax Notes, an article, uh, a gentleman by the name of Marty Sullivan, who the minority actually invited as a witness a couple weeks ago on tax reform, argued that double taxing on corporate income is bad economic policy. And, and let me quote what he wrote in the article. We should recognize that the movement from double taxation to flow through taxation is a step in the direction of sound policy. Tax reformers and professors will tell anyone who will listen that all business income should be taxed on a, full, on a flow through basis. I'd like to get opinions from Dr. Carroll and Dr. Marin on, on, Mr. on Dr. Sullivan's point that double taxation of business income is bad for jobs and the economy and good policy means moving toward taxing business income once. Do you agree or disagree and why? No, I, I do agree with that. As I've already alluded to it, or stated in my comments, uh, the double tax on corporate profits distorts economic decision making in a number of very important ways. It, 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 it leads to a higher degree of leverage in the economy, which is problematic. It leads to a misallocation of capital throughout the economy, which is problematic. And it raises the cost of capital, which discourages capital formation. That, that's also uh, problematic using one of uh, something Donald said earlier, uh, you know, economic fundamentals, not tax considerations, should drive decision making. And the double tax, I think, violates that, that principle. Thank you. Dr. Mern. Uh, I agree as well. I mean, there are lots of plans over time that <coughs> said, you know, if you could go back to the beginning and redesign a tax system from scratch, how would you want to design it? Uh, and there are different ways of doing it, but they all have this feature that you eliminate the double tax. Mr. Tarney, if you were forced to go and become a C Corp, how would that impact your ability uh, as a CFO to create jobs from your current tax system? I think it would uh, diminish it greatly. Uh, a small business owner thinks one way. I made a dollar, I should pay tax on that dollar. Not a dollar, and then after I get some money from it, then pay tax at the individual level. Th this is what how they think. One-time tax on that earnings. Flow through entities allow for that. Ms. Thompson, you mentioned that you do tax returns for a variety of clients, a lot of small business owners. Uh, how would a majority of your clients be impacted if we forced all businesses to pay at a C Corp rate? Without knowing all of the details of the tax reform, and if you were purely to say everything is going to stay in place except they're going to be now corporations and you're going to leave the double tax in place, they would be hurt tremendously. I've had clients who've been C corporations in the past who when they went to sell their business, they end up paying more than 50 percent in taxes and it was overwhelming to them. So it would really hurt them significantly if they had to go to a C corp level tax and pay double. Thank you. Um, I will yield time to Mr. Neal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Carroll, you mentioned that ESOP entities tended to do better in the recession in terms of retirement savings and, you know, that interest I have. Yeah, a, a number of different metrics <coughs> uh, we, uh, based on some analysis that, 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 that I've done. Uh, it looks like ESOPs did fare better during the recession than, than S Corp ESOPs fared better uh, during the recession. They had they grew at a faster rate. Um, <clears throat> they added more jobs. Um, generally, they have higher average wages, and generally, the uh, you know, th they have a greater retirement security. Uh, let me follow up on the point Mr. Thompson was making uh, to you about anti-abuse rules 
If the corporate tax was significantly lowered, and you pointed out, as you did, that the lower rates usually don't foster abuse, but I think that what he was trying to get at was that the abuse that might arise if the corporate rate was at 15 percent and the highest individual rate was at 35 percent. Did you see some movement of earnings to the corporate form? Oh, you, you, um, there, there, there is movement between, uh, at a high level, there's, there's movement between <clears throat> the flow through sector and the C corporation sector, um, depending on the relationship of the, the, uh, the individual tax rate and the corporate tax rate. We saw that after the 86 Act um, with the repeal of the general utilities doctrine and, and as well as um, the change in the relationship of the rates, we saw uh, you know, a, a movement that, that some research that I did a while back uh, ascribed to the change in the rates. Uh, Austin Goolsby has done some research in the area as well that has found that the number of businesses or the level of activity within each sex sector is sensitive to the relative taxation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Paulson is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, maybe I'll just follow up uh, with Mr. Tarney. I didn't get to ask you a question before, but you listed several items as a part of your testimony that were important for tax reform to be in consideration. And, you know, we all agree tax reform is necessary. You got the corporate component, you got the pass through entities, which we're talking about today. But can you just discuss in greater detail a couple of the items or maybe the top? handful of most important issues that should be focused on that would be the best, I mean, the absolute best to actually help spur economic growth and capital formation and investment. Uh, you know, if, if there's just sort of a, a top wish list that should absolutely be focused on. I think uh, the timing and the requirements of an S corporation, because it is complex because of the levels of uh, if you have certain stock structures, you can't be an S corporation. Certain number of shareholders, you couldn't be things. I think that could be simplified. Um, um, I don't. I don't agree with the alternative minimum tax, but I think that if you can't take it away, then I think it needs it needs to be revised and simplified. Okay. All right. Those are the two. And do you have any idea how, how many small business entities end up falling under sort of the alternative minimum tax uh, because of their pass-through income? Or, and maybe Carol, Mr. Carroll, you, 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 may, you may know, but you kind of nodded your head. But. I, I'm actually, I I'm actually don't know the answer to that, to that question, but it's, it's a very interesting question. <coughs> okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, maybe we can somehow have tax staff to look into that too because I know the alternative minimum tax is something that keeps trapping more and more people, and a lot of these people that pay – Small businesses that pay also under the individual rates obviously would get trapped in that, so I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Berg is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've seen a lot of statistics that show our corporate rate is relationship to other countries across the world. My question is, tell me about the pass-through entities in these other countries. And again, you know, maybe Mr. Carroll or Dr. Carroll, you could start. Yeah. yeah uh a lot of other countries push businesses into the corporate form uh, in pursuit of limited liability. That's one of the dis distinguishing features, I think, between the U.S. and, and other countries is, is it's much um, easier to get limited liability in this country um, because of the flow-through form and the various organizational forms within in that sector. Um, and, and so it's, it's, that's one of the reasons we have a much larger um, flow-through sector than, than mo most other, other nations. Um, I, yeah, I think that's, that's the, in terms of the, one could also do a comparison of the kind of the tax rates that those are, those, the, that the, the, um, the flow through income received by individuals in the U.S. is subject to as compared to other nations. I'm uh, less familiar with those statistics. Yeah, Mr. Chair, my, my question kind of, you know, here in America we're trying to keep those two rates pretty close. Now, I'd argue that we should look at the net rate, not the gross rate, but so my question in these other countries, is their pass-through rate similar to their corporate rate, or is there a disparity in these other countries uh, that we're aware of? It, there, I think there does, without having looked at the data in detail, my, my um, sense would be that there tends to be some disparity. The corporate tax rates tend not to be particularly uh, high relative uh, to uh, individual tax rates. There are a few countries that have tried to apply, in a sense, separate tax systems, uh, in, particularly in the Nordic countries, where they treat the 
partnership income very, you know, very differently than um, the income of, of wage earners in order to um, coordinate the uh, corporate sector tax and the uh, flow through sector tax. Maybe, Mr. Chairman, to wrap up, just my question is one that nets out to the individual, the stockholder, where we're, we're competing with another country that has a low corporate income tax. Are they paying a very high personal income tax so that net that that person's paying? Uh, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> so when you, when you look at looking at it a different way, if you look at the uh, kind of the net after tax uh, amount received for a dollar invested in the corporate sector abroad, you know, kind of what is the, the, the sum total of the double tax on, on corporate profits for a dollar paid out as dividends, you know, the, it tends to that tax bite when you look at both levels, the corporate and individual level of tax tends to be higher abroad than, than here. The U.S. tends to have a higher uh, level of tax on a dollar invested in the corporate sector and paid out as dividends than our major trading partners. And if the rate were to go up, the top individual, or the, the dividends and capital gains rates were to go up, then that, that difference would become actually fairly substantial. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Berg. Ms. Berkeley is recognized. Thank you, Mr. T. Berry. Um, I kind of caught something, uh, Ms. Thompson, that you said, and I just wanted to make sure that I understand it completely. Um, uh, Sen uh, Secretary Geithner, I uh, has suggested that some pass-through entities are, in fact, very large firms, not the traditional small businesses, at least I think of it. Uh, these uh, large firms have revenues in the tens of millions of dollars. Uh, Mr. Paulson, I think, asked you what the impact of being taxed as a C corporation would be on your clients. Could you share with us what percentage of your clients are of the size that Sen uh, Secretary Geithner was referring to? That's not the level of my clients. My clients are very small businesses. They have probably four to six members, and their revenues are probably. You mean uh, employees or members? No, um, owners of the company. Okay. So you're talking about either CS or pass through entity owners. There's probably four to six of them, so they're very small from the measure of owners. And then as far as revenue, they're probably, I'm going to say, um, 25 million or less. Okay, so the comments that uh, Secretary Geithner made would not... It's not typical of my firm. All right. And, and Mr. Marin, um, in your opinion, what percent of the pass-throughs are of the very large size that uh, Secretary Geithner was referring to? It's a very small percentage. It's a, it's a very small percentage of the population, but a significant fraction of the economic activity. Say, uh, please say that again. Oh, sure. If you do it by counting the number of firms or the number of businesses, mm -hmm. the number that are in that size range appears to be very small. Mm -hmm. uh, but because they're large, they account for a fairly large fraction of the economic activity, whether it's assets or revenues or income, that are accounted mm -hmm. for by pass-throughs as a whole. I see. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Dr. Bastani is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Marin's testimony talked about partnership activity uh, conducted through large partnerships and not small businesses. And, but aren't many of these large partnerships actually joint ventures uh, whose partners happen to be corporations themselves, Dr. Carroll? Yeah, there's a significant fraction of partnership income that's uh, where, stated a different way, so the owners of partnerships can be individuals or corporations, unlike, let's say, an S corporation where there's a restriction, only individuals can uh, own an S corporation, a sole proprietor is by definition uh, an individual, and, but for partnerships, um, based on the statistics I've seen, roughly 50% of partnership income is, uh, results from partnerships that, are, that have corporate owners. So you could think of you know, two companies that engage in a, in a partnership, a joint venture to do something, build a project, and, um, and then they distribute the income to the two corporate owners. So about half of the, uh, about half of the, uh, the partnership biz activity is, is, seems to be uh, owned by corporations. So if we were to tax those entities, th those large partnerships or joint ventures like C-Corps, then if, in effect, we're subje subjecting them to, to uh, triple taxation. Is that correct? Yeah, if, if you did that, there's a long tradition of, of having flow-through um, 
a treatment of partnerships for that very reason that they, they you know, for, you know uh, they're, that they're owned by other businesses, just as if a C corporation owned another C corporation, um, then, then you wouldn't want to kind of have multiple layers of tax on the same, uh, same activity. There's usually a dividends received deduction um, associated with um, uh, uh, income that flows from one part of a, uh, a, a complex business unit to another. So in effect, the joint venture is being taxed, the corporate par partners are being taxed, and then the shareholders of the, uh, of the car corporate partners would be taxed. So in effect, really triple taxation. Right, if yeah. that, that was the change. Thank you. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Bustani. Thank you all, all the witnesses who are here today. And members are advised that members may submit written questions to our witnesses. Those questions and the witnesses' answers will be made part of the record of today's hearing. Again, thank you to the four of you for appearing today. It has been an educational discussion, and I hope just the beginning. And it's hopefully helpful in moving the conversation forward on comprehensive tax reform. This hearing is adjourned.